one question that I get asked more often than anything else is what editor am I using and what theme I'm using. So I thought in this episode, I would explain what editor I'm using and just some of the extensions that I use to be most productive. My editor of choice has become Microsoft Visual Studio Code. In the past, I used Vim, RubyMine, and also Sublime Text. And I believe any of these editors or IDEs are perfectly suitable to do the job at hand. However, it ultimately comes down to your personal preference. And I found for myself, I am most productive in Visual Studio Code. And while I could download the application from the website, I prefer to use Homebrew for most of my installations. So I'll do a brew search, the Visual Studio Code, and you'll see that it comes up with the Insiders version, which is a pre-release or a beta version, or the normal install. So then I'll do a brew cask install, and then I'll reference the Visual Studio Code, and you'll see that it downloads it from the same URL that you would have downloaded it from the actual website. So you are getting the same thing. And once Visual Studio Code is installed, we can access it with a command line code, and then from whichever directory we're in, we can call a dot, and then it'll open up Visual Studio Code within that location. So on the left hand side, we can see our project and we can toggle our navigation bar, and then we can also install extensions. So I'll first install a few extensions I use by default. The first is the Ruby one, and this will provide some of the Ruby language and debugging support for the application. And then Ruby Solograph is also a very handy one for code completion and inline documentation. And if you use Rubocop within your application, then having Rubocop as an extension, then it'll give you some indication if the code that you are writing needs to be refactored a little bit. There's also some Git extensions that I use quite often. The first one is Git Lens, and this gives you some history into some of your code. So you'll see over to the right of the code who last authored that line of code, and Git History is also a very good one for just being able to go back and see what has been changed in the past from a particular file, or you can compare to different branches. And then we get into some more of the styling ones that I like to use. For example, the theme that I like the most is, is the Grubbox theme. And it's one that I found on the dark medium that I can stare at for long periods of time without my eyes becoming sore. This paired with a good monitor allows me to code all day long. And another one that I really like is the VS Code icons. And the icons are really helpful because it gives you a quick glance to see what kind of file you're about to click on, and it makes searching for them a little bit quicker and easier. And another must have, because I do have multiple computers, I have a desktop, I also have a laptop that I switch back and forth between, there's one called the Settings Sync. And the Settings Sync will allow you to have a private gist on GitHub, and it'll upload all your settings to that gist, and then you can download them whenever you're at your other computer, so it keeps your development environment in sync with one another. And finally, the other one that I use is the Code Runner. And the Code Runner allows you to execute a bit of code directly from within your editor, and not something where you have to load up your terminal and then execute it from there. And so when setting the icons, if I hit Command Shift P, we can type in the icon, and this will set our file icon theme. And you can select the VS Code to get the nice little icons over on the left hand side of the files or folders. Using the Command Shift P again, you can also select your color theme. With the color theme, I always use the Grubbox Dark and the Medium. And with the Command Shift P again, you can see that I can upload or download my settings. So I'll click the Update Upload Settings. And once you configure it using their setup, which if you need to figure out how to set it up, you can go to sync and how to configure, or you can go over to your extensions tab and then look up the settings sync, and then you can see what it asks for. It'll prompt you for the gist ID. Once you get that set up, you don't have to worry about it again. You would just need to save that gist ID for your other development machine. So let's go ahead and write a bit of code. I'll create a class, and you can see that automatically it's starting to drop down with some suggestions. And the nice thing about this is that it does do the auto indenting for me, and it's just something that I really don't have to worry about. So let's just go ahead and create a simple Hello World app. And so right off the bat, once we look at this, we can see that our initialize, it has these green squigglies underneath, 
And that's because it's not following the best practices, according to Rubicop, and it says that it should put the empty method definitions on a single line. Then also for the class hello, it's missing a top level class documentation comment. So I'll go ahead and put in the comment in there and then hit save, and then that squiggly goes away. For the other one, if I'm not quite sure what it's asking for or what it wants, then I can hit the control shift and R, and Rubicop will automatically fix this to what it was intending. Once I save the file, you can see that the squiggly goes away. And using the code runner is very easy as well. Once we have the file opened up that we want to use, over on the right hand side at the top, we can use the run code. And you can see that using the control option and then the end key, you can also use that as a shortcut to run the code. But once you do in the output, you can see that it runs your code and you can see the expected output. So if you're test building with an API or something and you're just making a quick script, this could be very helpful. And if you're working with a project that's using Git, you can see that you have a Git tab and within here, you have the different changes that have been modified and then you'll be able to see the history of some of those as well. And so if I have a first commit, my changes have been saved and then on the right hand side, you can see where we have a first commit done. And once you start changing a file that has edits, you can start seeing that we get new lines showing up on the right hand side where this line was not existent before, so we have a plus. If we started to delete lines, then you'll see that lines have been removed. And you can always click on these to see a diff between what it was and what it is now. And if we make a change to a line where it's not added or deleted, we get our blue bar. You can see right from here what the old change was and what the new change is. And over on the right hand side, we see a modified showing that this file has been modified. And I mainly use Vim when I'm on the go with my iPad and I'll use the Blink shell to VPN into my home network. And from there, I'll SSH into my home computer. And then I can use the Blink shell to do any kind of development I need. But because it doesn't have a full fledged display, I just have the terminal. Using Vim is extremely helpful in those cases. And so in the marketplace, there is a lot more options and you can always find the recommended ones or the most popular ones. And by seeing the most popular ones, you can kind of get a feel of what others are using. And I'm not looking to start a editor war, but place a comment and let me know what editor you're using and if you're using any other extensions that I've not featured here. Well, that's all for this episode. Thank you for watching. For more videos, check out driftandruby.com.